Will be with us this evening. He is out of town. Other six members of the council are present. We have three items on our agenda. They're for discussion only. No action can or will be taken. The first one is the uh, draft to the water conservation and containment plan. Curtailment plan. I think Dave. Dave is the man. Dave, I want you to present. <laughs> Mayor, members of the council, good afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the Water Resources Department, I have the good fortune of uh, making the presentation on our proposed water conservation and curtailment plan. Uh, the mayor and council all should have received a copy of the draft plan itself. The purpose of the workshop is to obtain council's <laughs> input and feedback on the concepts, the planning, and the recommendations that uh, we've been working on to uh, get your get your feedback, then go out to all of the departments and stakeholders. Those stakeholders would include the uh, developers, the home builders, the private utilities, homeowners, and the regulatory agencies. We'll start off with our department mission: um, deliver quality water services, protect the public health, support the environment, and promote the economic vitality of the community. There are three elements of the water conservation and curtailment plan. One, conservation, which is self-explanatory. Two is drought management or drought response. That's when you have limits on what had been previously available due to uh, Mother Nature not cooperating with us. And three is curtailment where you actually have an event or series of events that curtails your ability to provide uh, enough water at any given moment. Conservation goals, it's simply demand management to ensure sustainability without adversely impacting the quality of life for our citizens. Uh, conservation needs to be both short-term and long-term, and in actuality, water conservation should be an ethic, not a mandate. It increases the amount of available water, it reduces the need for infrastructure and increased capacity, and probably mo most important at the top of my list is we are mandated under the Arizona Groundwater Management Act to have a conservation plan. And in the third management plan itself, there are specific conservation goals and objectives that are enumerated. We obviously do have our physical and legal availability. We calculate the actual demand and supplies we do our risk assessment, both as to uh, drought contingencies or, or uh, uh, when and for how long droughts might occur. We do have outages, both planned for routine maintenance. We also have unplanned outages. For example, a water main may break. We could have an electrical storm. And most recently, we've had Superfund contamination that resulted in a well shutdown. These are our actual demands. You can see as the city grows, so does the water consumption. We provided you with the last um, four years and a fifth year estimated of average day demand and peak demand in those annual increases. One of the things, and this is the proverbial catch-22, is right now the city is about 100% reliant on groundwater supplies. We are not susceptible to drought unlike other providers who have Salt River Project or Central Arizona Project water supplies. However, to enhance and increase our water portfolio and provide future resources, we do have CAP subcontracts. We have a reallocation, a 100-year lease with the Gila River Indian Settlement. So those surface water supplies at some date in, in, in the future could be subject to uh, drought and reduced uh, available delivery totals. Groundwater supply and water conservation. Reclaimed water, one of, the, one of the largest growing components of our portfolio is effluent. And it is our recommendation that this city's policy is to adopt 100% reuse, whether it's direct reuse for irrigation, dust control, landscaping, or to recharge and recover for credits. Unaccounted for losses. Any system will incur losses. We've just embarked on a leak detection project to reduce those, to identify those, and reduce those. And as I said, conservation is simply, if we can avoid waste and become most efficient, there's no reason while you brush your teeth to let that faucet continue to run. These are the real reasons we have to be consistent with the Arizona Groundwater Management Act 
in order for us to show an assured water supply and get that designation and future redesignation, we need to have an aggressive, cost-effective conservation program with the bottom line reduction in per capita consumption. Drought considerations. As I said, as we become more surface water dependent, which will be a good thing because you reduce your replenishment obligation and build your water portfolio, the bad news is the Colorado River system is subject to drought. We have to plan for the severity and the length. Emergency outages, as I mentioned, uh, main breaks, electrical storms, possible Superfund contamination. These are the user, user sectors. Difficult slide to read, my apologies, but it shows in pie chart form residential, turf irrigation, miscellaneous use, industrial, commercial, and multifamily. The greatest potential for water conservation is in the exterior uh, residential uh, sector. But we can also work with our large industrial um, users in terms of site-specific reuse, um, multiple cycling of water for cooling towers, etc. cetera. Tur tur turf irrigation is different than residential turf irrigation. Yes, sir. Uh, large turf facilities, uh, parks, golf courses, open space, uh, both passive and active recreation areas. Is that, excuse me, is that uh, on the chart within your book, you've stated city use. Is that uh, in conjunction with this? Because that's different than the chart here in the book. Uh, Mayor, Council Member Osborne, when, when you look at that, the, uh, the, the municipal usage uh, would, would most probably, well, not probably, would most of the city related um, component of that pie chart is included in the turf areas because the city is the largest um, turf user. You'd have other governmental entities, school districts, for example, with uh, their school sites, turf, etc. The water conservation challenges. We need to have an aggressive, cost-effective conservation program. It doesn't do any of us any good to mandate one dollar worth of conservation if we only get 80 cents worth of benefit. We need to be smart, we need to be consistent with the Groundwater Management Act. If for whatever reason the city is not able to meet its per capita consumption mandate, there are alternative conservation programs, the non-per capita program that's available under the Groundwater Management Act, both the third, fourth, and fifth management plans for the Phoenix Active Management Area. We will be coming to you with specific ordinances. Some have been referenced in, in your report. Again, it's a matter of public policy and input received from you all, our citizens and the stakeholders, as to what provides the proverbial biggest bang for the buck. Mayor and Council have already adopted tiered rate structures to, incur uh, to uh, encourage conservation. And again, if we have a water-intensive industry move to the city of Goodyear, which we certainly anticipate and hope for, we can work with those individual users to conduct water audits and see how they can increase their production efficiencies or manufacturing efficiencies as to individual water usage. Again, keeping in mind, what we'll try to do is match water quality with appropriate end use. In other words, when it comes to irrigation, dust control, construction water, cooling tower, we can use non-potable water. We can use effluent. We can use remediated Superfund groundwater. Which brings us to what you're most interested in, water conservation opportunities and policies. Ordinances. We can adopt low-flow plumbing fixture ordinances. We can adopt turf limitations in terms of square footage type ordinances. We can adopt water wasting ordinances where penalties are incurred. Drought management, to be able to respond when surface water supplies are curtailed. In other words, to ask for percentage reductions. The water conservation and curtailment plant, as I said, to provide enough system redundancy so that if we have an unplanned outage, we may have to do a com um, combination of mandating certain um, water use restrictions as part of that curtailment plant. The education and outreach, public education and outreach is absolutely critical. 
Goodyear is a member of the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association and has a ton of information and materials with regard to conservation. Zero scape, how we landscape, what we landscape, very important. Water use it wisely. Just recently, Mr. Bradford made the decision for the city to become a water use it wisely partner. We get a lot of air time, both TV and radio, encouraging conservation, giving specific conservation tips. Specific Goodyear uh, programs. That means we can go out with homeowner packages when they move to the booming metropolis of Goodyear, Arizona. When our industries move here, we can go out and work with them, individual audits. And then outreach to um, K through 12. Individual end user programs, be they residential or industrial or commercial. The big thing that we see around town is the little tents in restaurants where that water is not delivered with your meal unless you specifically ask for it. And for every 12 ounce glass of water you drink, believe it or not, it takes eight gallons to wash that. Would you say that again? For every? If I had to put that glass, that one glass of water, after I drank it in my dishwasher, it would take eight gallons to wash that glass. So it's not just the consumed water, the aftermath. I pulled that out of a conservation handbook somewhere in there. I wash that glass by hand. <laughs> or, From now on, you wash your glass when you take it out now by hand. And it dry. Hey, Council Member Lord, I've been using the same plastic water glass for 14 years. <laughs> water conservation opportunities, the incentives that the city can provide, both as a matter of uh, instilling that conservation ethic and the uh, financial uh, incentives are probably uh, the most workable. Rebates, I know when I was with Glendale, we had a very successful low flow fixtures um, rebate program along with turf reduction uh, rebates. But in the turf reduction, you had to reduce at least 100 square feet of turf as a minimum. Las Vegas, um, Southern Nevada Water Authority, has a rebate program, they give you $1 for every one square foot of turf that you reduce. Replacement, obviously there are the latest and greatest in water conservation technologies. We need to make sure we identify what works and then replace those older technologies with the newer <coughs> technologies. And rewards, the biggest reward any water user would get is that you have lower water bills. Alternative water sources, as we said, this city, we are, we are uh, uh, recommending 100% reuse policy so that reclaimed water, once it's produced, either gets recharged or puts to beneficial end use. The same is true with our remediated uh, groundwater from our two Superfund sites. Brackish water is going to be part of the strategy of how we deal with brine and our brine management programs. There may, in fact, be a beneficial end use for that brackish water. Um, we're, we're looking at some innovative technologies to see what that might be to ensure cost effectiveness. And then lastly, um, Mayor Councilmember Member Holland. Um, back to the brackish water. One of the things that um, I didn't read in the book that I, I think we just ought to keep in the back of our minds about the brackish water is maybe we can start figuring out how to reduce it before it becomes brackish. Um, for example, um, if, you, if uh, we could encourage new homeowners to use uh, potassium in their water softeners instead of salt, we would have less water problems in the end. I know it would take a long time, but that is one of the issues that we keep bringing up and we keep reading in books. Uh, Mayor Council Member Holland, the uh, Central Arizona Salinity Study, of which we are the uh, project participants, has a very good uh, final draft report that we'll be bringing to the city as well that identifies a number of opportunities <coughs> in how to deal with managed brackish water. And that's one of them, just because the, the traditional water softener does, uh, does add salt to the system, which is a bad thing. There are some newer technology uh, water softeners that um, obviously reduce that salt flow and save some water, but, but again, the, the the key element for us is to make sure that we do a real thorough cost-benefit analysis to make sure that you do get that bang for the buck. Well, you know, I, I agree with Brenda on that. I often thought when we bought our water softener this time, I kept thinking there must be something better than this. 
but there was no information out there. So, so I commend you. What you're doing is getting the information out. I, I thought the same thing you, especially about right, the salt right. in, 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 in our, the package. They are talking about the packets out to the new home buyers to tell them about uh, the uh, maybe the, a rebate or whatever for turf, and so something like this ought to be included. Maybe we can stop it at the before we actually have to deal with a lot of the brackish. I mean, we're already trying having to deal with it. It costs us to deal with it. We have to figure out what to do with it. Um, so I'm just trying to think even back beyond that. Uh, Mayor, Council Member Lord, Council Member Holland, I appreciate the uh, uh, the input. That that is certainly a priority with us because Brian and Brian disposal, Brian management is is really, really one of our our tough challenges. But uh, we, we've got a lot of regional and sub regional partnerships looking at that along with us. So we're we're not alone in in meeting that challenge. I uh, just wanted to finish up unaccounted for losses. This is simply to do uh, to conduct an aggressive leak, leak uh, detection program, so that if you do have any uh, system loss, you can make the necessary repairs. On the financial side, there may may be some financial house cleaning that needs to be done once again in order to to make sure that you're you're getting full cost recovery for your service. Uh, things such as slow meters or broken meters also need to be serviced and addressed so that you can get an accurate reflection of what your actual deliveries are and um, that, that payment is made accordingly. Curtailment opportunities. Most of the valley cities have various stages in, uh, contained in their, in their drought management plan. And again, let me emphasize that drought management is where you plan on having X amount of water available to you, surface water, and because of drought, what you had planned on being available is no longer available. There are significant conversations that are taking place at the Arizona Water Banking Authority, the Central Arizona Water Conservation District, with all of the CAP subcontractors in terms of planning for that drought, the duration of the drought, and what that actually means in quantifiable reductions in water availability. Those are something that we can quantify and, and plan for. The, the key element here is, and, and we don't have a specific trigger identified yet. That's the proverbial work in progress. But what we're suggesting, or yeah, what we're suggesting at this point in time and be uh, discussing with our various stakeholders is if there is water production and or delivery capabilities that are curtailed, whatever that percentage curtailment is, would be a trigger in moving to a stage one. If it becomes more severe, you move to a stage two. If it becomes more severe to a stage three and so on. So that as that water supply and availability shrink, Obviously, the the, um, uh, the mandates, the curtailment-related mandates, become uh, more severe. Uh, interesting, um, interesting example in San Antonio, Texas, which was the home of the um, American Water Works Association annual conference last year. In their daily newspaper, they have a depth to groundwater uh, in their box, mm. and that if for whatever reason that depth to groundwater exceeds that acceptable level, they go to an automatic reduction. They go to their automatic stage one. So it's, it's quantifiable. It's something that um, you all as policymakers and our citizens can look to, but that trigger is going to be a very, very, very important element of uh, the curtailment. These are just examples of stage one, voluntary reductions, municipal department, uh, obviously getting the word out. And then providing, we just not we, we have an obligation to not only let people know what's going on, but to provide them with some tools so that they can respond. How do they reduce their interior and exterior water use? And David, I guess it's we also have to set good examples. Is that part of of that uh, process? Mayor, Council Member Holland, the first. Uh, let me back up. You see on there that the uh, second bullet yeah. is the municipal department reduction. That would be the city's matching the voluntary request. Ours, however, would be mandatory. You do lead by example. Yes, that's what I was wondering. One of the most dramatic, um, I don't know how many of you remember that the uh, Northwest uh, Valley uh, APS facility, they're switching yard, had the fire. 
and APS went out with a call with a call to the public for 10 10 percent immediately reduction mm -hmm. in energy it wasn't mandated but it was a very successful um, outreach and they exceeded that 10 percent uh, requested threshold stage two you can see is a little more dramatic we go to 10 percent um, for for municipal departments and continued uh, outreach and education stage three Stage four, this is the most draconian stage in, that, that, we can, that we can envision, and you can see that it is dramatic. When you refer to a meteorological drought, what, what exactly, or when is that exactly? Uh, Mayor Council Member Osborne, you either have, but the, the drought can occur on your watershed coupled with a lack of rainfall mm -hmm. so that the watershed itself that is respond is your source of surface water deliveries those deliveries are curtailed in addition with a lack of rainfall you don't get the, the groundwater the naturally occurring groundwater recharge to rehabilitate your groundwater aquifers so both both or each of those have have a have a drought impact associated with them if you've hit that scenario is that more on the level three or level two I mean where do you <coughs> the level with that uh, mayor council member Osborne that is all going to be part and parcel of the um, comprehensive development of a trigger that that we, we, we can't say with certainty tonight mm -hmm. what that's going to be okay. because it's a combination of the availability of the resource water molecules coupled with the availability <coughs> to deliver ie the infrastructure because uh, an outage an unplanned outage let's say a water main break or an electrical storm is different than not having the molecules available well, one is infrastructure one is media meteorological okay. the expected conservation results We will be in compliance with the Arizona Groundwater Management Act. We will be in compliance with the um, requirements of designation and redesignation for our assured water supply. We will have demonstrative, quantifiable water savings, whether that's illustrated by a reduction in per capita or just simply an availability, uh, additional availability of water saved. Um, we expect that our programs will be as aggressive, if not more aggressive, than our sister cities. We do have economic development uh, considerations. We want to be reasonable and cost effective when we're uh, asking for water savings. We don't want to, you know, you don't want to overplay or overkill uh, something that, that uh, has a chilling effect on your economic development. The more diversified our water portfolio is, the better off we're going to be. The more water in the bucket, the better off we're all going to be. And then to have that emergency, uh, to, to, be, to be ready to respond to all of the envisioned um, kinds of emergency and drought situations that we might, uh, might endure. Proactive, cost effective, more water. It says it all. Where do we go from here? As I said, the Water Resources Department and the other departments will work to review uh, specific ordinances that we can uh, bring before you for consideration. Uh, the final adoption of this plan, we don't have a deadline. Uh, we'll look to the city manager uh, for guidance there. And then to uh, create uh, and fund water conservation uh, opportunities in the interim. And what that translates into is simply we are going to explore the latest and greatest in terms of conservation technologies. We have a grants coordinator now that can help us. We have in the past received money from both EPA and the Bureau of Reclamation for Conservation. We'll continue to uh, aggressively pursue those programs. We are now part of Water Use It Wisely. We are part of the Project um, WET, which is the outreach to uh, elementary schools. And then um, under the, the 
Brownwater uses advisory council. Uh, Mr. Cleveland sits on that. I think he chairs that. Is the uh, Department of Water Resources has various uh, grant uh, grants, conservation related grants that are available. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor Council. Be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Um, okay, Dave. Let's just start on the right and then we'll. You know, I have a, a dozen or more questions and comments. If you've all heard many of this, I don't want to hold you all tonight, but I do have quite a bit. Um, did you want to start with me? <laughs> I don't care. Some of our questions well, might help it, you. It's possible. It's possible. So, um, so give them a little chime in. Okay, okay. Yeah. Um, first of all, in uh, um, and I'm referring out of the book, okay? So page 11 on your table, you were showing up our population, and that seemed way off to me, and so I wondered uh, what the reasoning was behind that. Are you talking about um, the population is low? Yes. The uh, mayor, council member Osborne, what that shows, and we're, we're updating the population projections. Uh, these were originally generated uh, from, from MAG is those are only our service area population. Okay, In so other words, for our customers south, that are south of I-10, that does not include um, residents of either the uh, Arizona American Water Company or uh, Litchfield Park Service Company. So when you add those in, you're going you're to get what is the total city okay. population. And that does lead me into the next question. When you have your code compliance officers out investigating different water situations, running water, you know, streets, alleyways, is that south of the 10 also, or is that statewide? An interesting jurisdictional and legal question you, you just asked. Um, in, historically, there has been the spirit of cooperation between the Arizona Corporation Commission and the Arizona Department of Water Resources in terms of conservation ordinances that are adopted by cities, that we are trying to also make sure that those ordinances apply to the service area of the private utility, um, and if it and if that is in fact the case, then the private utility is able to amortize uh, and get a reasonable rate of return on their conservation mandates or whatever expenditures that that they make. Um, and, and more recently, Excuse me. so our, our that two sentences you gave me, I still don't know what you're saying. Are you saying that both municipalities the, work together the, the under the same, and, and they both reap the same benefits of, of rebate or whatever you want to call it? Correct. Mayor, uh, Council Member Lord, and Council Member Osborne, the thing is, is that the city ordinance applies to all the citizens within our, our uh, incorporated city boundaries. Okay. So those conservation mandates that are in place south of the freeway are also in place north of the freeway. But who's doing e the code e compliance? Even though we are not, well, it would be our code compliance officers because it's a city ordinance. Okay. And we would expect, as a matter of policy and politics, that the private utility also adopt and, and enforce what the city is requesting. But there, there's no teeth behind it. If we say there's a 10% reduction in play, Two different water sources. They're looked at as two different autonomous companies, if you will. There's no teeth in us dictating what happens within Lipsco or Arizona American Water. Mayor, Council Member Antonio, that, that's right. Because the Arizona Corporation Commission, if you have a CCNN, if that if that customer is paying his or her bill, you have an obligation to serve. But again, it's jurisdictional. Um, there, uh, I, I believe that with with the latest bill that the governor vetoed in terms of service deliveries within an irrigation district, that that has the same kind of applicability for, for a municipal provider. They're first and foremost citizens of Goodyear vis-a-vis uh, -vis a customer of Lipsco. And again, historically, it's our obligation to make sure we work with the private utility and the Arizona Corporation Commission so that we don't find ourselves in this no teeth, as you explained it, the no teeth scenario. We need to be able to have the Corporation Commission as a condition of, for example, Lipsco's or Arizona American CCNN to agree to abide by the City of Goodyear's ordinances, and that would be something we'd strongly insist on. It, 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 makes, it just makes good sense. Um, on page 24, you have the Outreach Initiative Partnerships. 
And um, I just thought that um, partnerships with um, developers should be part of that. I think it is. Table listings. Residential or industrial, whichever. Uh, Mayor, Council Member Osborne, uh, when, when, we, when we reference partnerships, we're, we're as all-inclusive as we can be. And if we miss the stakeholder group in here, we'll, we'll, we'll correct that. But obviously developers and, and the home builder communities uh, have a vested interest in this. Okay. Which a couple of these uh, thoughts I had were adding certain um, responsibilities to developers or to residences, uh, which I could, you know, email you. Um, a question I did have, though, on page 26, you referred to research on the possibility of using Superfund site groundwater from PGA South for potable use. Potable use means drinking water, correct? Uh, Mayor, Council Member Osborne, yes, it does. Okay. Why would we want it to be used for potable water rather than going maybe more for irrigation or, or landscaping, rather going straight to potable water? Uh, good, good question. Um, I believe about this time last year, the uh, mayor and council approved uh, a bulk water delivery agreement with Goodyear Tire and Rubber which is the responsible party for PGA South. In that bulk water delivery agreement, the, the, the water usage is defined as quote unquote, appropriate beneficial end use. It doesn't state potable. Scottsdale is using water from its Superfund site and the science and the public health and safety uh, criteria has, has uh, proven this to be successful that that remediated groundwater with the proper treatment can be used for potable use. In this, we're not committing to potable use, but we can include use all the way to potable if, if the mayor and council decide uh, as, as a matter of policy that that's the way they want to go. But in our, in our agreement, it says appropriate, beneficial, end use. Okay. Specifically, in Scott said they're stripping TCE out of the water. Mm -hmm. TCE, uh, Councilmember Antonia, correct. Since about 1986. Since 1986? Mm -hmm. And there, there are other municipalities throughout the uh, country that, that also uh, uses their remediated Superfund water for potable use. We can identify those and bring a list to, uh, to the Council's attention. Well, moving on. <laughs> um, uh, page 33. You had a listing of your, your brackish waters in there. The, uh, alternative water sources. You didn't put in that gray water in there in this chart, and I wondered why. Mayor, Council Member Osborne, uh, just point of reference. I, I've been in this business for uh, 23 years, and gray. Water I've been zero. <laughs> Uh, I, I, want, I wanted to preface my remarks by saying that in those 23 years, gray water has become a term of art. I mean, some people define gray water as what comes off their roof during a storm event. Some people define gray water as storm water runoff. So th th there are um, the, the, the definitions are across, across the board. Okay. Uh, in, in terms of reuse in, in gray water, um, I, I think you have a number of challenges in terms of the storage of gray water. Uh, you have real water quality concerns with gray water. Um, so, so in those regards, if those are the if those are the source waters, uh, I, I would suggest we, we don't go down that path. If in fact, and here again, being a term of art, if gray water defines what goes down your dishwasher and your kitchen sink and your bathroom shower, then it's a little different. That goes into our sewer flow, is treated and available for reuse. That's what I was thinking, reading other sections in here, that's what I was thinking the gray water was, was just what you said, dishwasher, shower, that type of thing. Um, these, other, these other items I can easily, um, they're just adding things to these tables, and so I don't want to waste the time on that. Uh, Mayor Councilmember Osborne will afford to your comments and working with you. Thank you. Councilmember Holland. Uh, mine will be easier. 
Uh, you know, <clears throat> since I've been involved, you know, you've created a monster here because I'm in the, involved with the water department all the time and take my, my monthly tours and the whole works. Um, and because of all the things I've been reading, uh, I do want to make sure that some of the uh, information and that, that we're really putting it in the right places to uh, educate our folks. And so I think part of that will be in our policy, and some of it should be in our um, our, our conservation ordinance that, we're, that will be coming up. But I'd like to see things also in there like uh, uh, encouraging hot water circulation um, equipment and, and, and things like that that we know will benefit, that's, that is so obvious. Um, and then I got to go back to the beginning of where how we get the water treated anyway, and Sean's heard this, this come from my mouth before about, if you don't put salt in the ground and you're not flushing your uh, prescription pills down the toilet, because that is a big problem with our water system, because that means we're not educating our people not to do that, because that's the same water they're going to be drinking. And I don't know, it just seems like it all, all kind of tied together. And somehow in our policies, I think we ought to try to tie it together for our folks. Uh, Mayor, Council Member Holland, uh, I, the, the prescription medications is, is a new phenomenon. Yeah, I just and, and I know the Center example, for Disease but, Control is doing research in terms yeah. of the impact. Uh, but, but specifically, uh, to, to answer your question, if we have large, if we have water intensive industries which which will move or you know locate or relocate to Goodyear um, with, with an aggressive pretreatment program and working with those um, uh, industries on their site specific challenges that's our responsibility as a city because it makes them more efficient uh, more environmentally responsive and it's it's just good policy from the city's perspective so um, on, on the residential side, it, it's a little more challenging, uh, but but we will certainly look at prohibitions of, of what you can put down your sink. I mean, that's that's why we have uh, bulk pickup and hazardous waste pickup to, to make sure that uh, things that are toxic or, or pose a public health or safety risk don't get put into a source water stream that, that could have uh, consequences uh, later on down the train. But I think that's all to do with your, your public relation program. Because how many times do I have something in the kitchen in my hand and I say, I don't know where to put it. <laughs> I don't know if I should put it down the garbage disposal. Or I so, I mean, those, it's just information that really, truly people want to do the right thing, but they just don't know what to do. So I think that's our responsibility to make sure that program is dynamic enough that we get the message out. Uh, Mayor, Council Member Lord, I, I agree. And in terms of monsters, so long as they are the proud recipient of the Golden Plunger Award, monsters are welcome. Oh, all right. Well, I know, you know, um, kind of continuing the same theme, you know, Paul has got our flashes going on in the Palm Valley Theater, and of course we're going to have a brand new theater that will be able to do some of that type of thing, too, and maybe that's a good education place to start because we don't know all these things. No, no one ever told me not to flush my pills down the toilet or not to, you know, uh, let my, the water run until it gets hot. So some things we've had to learn through the years and that's one of them. So, thank you. Vice Mayor? Yeah, I'm on, uh, just a couple of things. One, it's been bothering me. <clears throat> I've been good years since 91 and I started building a house sometime after that and I was told that uh, we, we would have a 100-year water supply for every development that um, Goodyear puts in. What does that, what does that mean? I mean, uh, that means I have uh, uh, 83 years left on my... <laughs> <laughs> Mayor, Vice Mayor, if you yeah, built in 91, you're exactly right. You do have 83 years left. <laughs> but I mean, what... We always talk about this 100-year water supply. You know. uh, there must be a reason for that. There, there is. Under the Groundwater Management Act, the two primary goals are, by the year 2025, to achieve safe yield. And what that means is in the Phoenix Active Management that you're not pumping more groundwater than in excess of what either nature or or the cities and other um, water purveyors can artificially recharge. In other words, you want to reach a balance. 
because we've been over pumping our, our aquifers and and uh, building an economy on a non-renewable resource, which is a very dangerous proposition. So safe yield is, is the number one goal. Number two goal is, and this gets back to the old land fraud days, and then it subsequently uh, morphed into a, a very good policy, is developers can't pull a building permit unless that purveyor is either designated or has a certificate of assured water supply. Now what that means, very simply, is at that given point in time, we have both the legal availability and the physical availability for that service area population plus a 10-year projection for a 100-year period. And every 10 years, we have to go back to the Arizona Department of Water, Resource, water Resources and prove that once again. As you know, you were part of, of our, um, uh, back in April of last year, we went in for a redesignation of our assured water supply. That was very limited. It was only our expectation is that redesignation will be for three years. The next time we go in, we will have what's what we're referring to affectionately as the all-in. By that I mean all of our CAP, all of our Indian lease water, all of our wastewater will be calculated. That was not done. But again, once you get that designation for that service area population plus the 10-year projection, you have the ability to pull those permits. But every 10 years, you have to go back in and, and uh, make the case once again. Legal availability, excuse me, physical availability, legal right to that water. You have to be consistent with the groundwater management code, and you have to have um, uh, appropriate water quality. And then the last criteria is the financial capability to develop water and wastewater infrastructure to meet that build out service area population. Well, the other, only other thing is that I'll, no, some of the other I'll talk to you about later, but the, <clears throat> you don't mention the Leeds construction specifically, but in all new constructions coming into Goodyear, is there some way to encourage uh, these new buildings to be uh, uh, Leeds certified? Is there is there something we can do to encourage that? Uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, we had uh, actually looked at the possibility of a LEED certification for one of the new fire stations and the, um, uh, the Water Resources Department administrative building. Uh, the architectural design cost far exceeded uh, uh, anything that we had projected. Uh, but, but having said that, uh, it, it's always a good idea <coughs> to make all of your public facilities as energy and water efficient as possible. And there are certainly things that we can employ through the unified plumbing code, or as I said, adoption of some of this new technology that we feel has, has a great deal of merit, uh, to go ahead and employ those technologies in any new construction. That, that's entirely appropriate. Uh, eventually, the cost of having a LEED certified building, if all the future buildings are going to be LEED certified, uh, I, I suspect that the cost will be a little more uh, in line with standard construction. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Lord. Um, first of all, thank you for the presentation. This was really fantastic. It's a team effort. Well, I, I commend you. Um, but there's just a few things that came to mind, so I'll just start. I think as a council, that we need to have a policy that we can relate to staff on different types of companies coming to Goodyear uh, and the amount of water they use. And we need to, to, to put this together with what type of income level do we want those employees to have at that company? Is it worth the use of water that they might have to use? Do we want, it, uh, do we want salary levels? at $25,000 a year, or do you want salaries at $50,000 a year? And we use that. That will determine, do we want that user? If it's a high water user and it's low income positions, maybe maybe we don't want we don't want that. And I was just thinking, as a council, maybe we ought to get together and kind of come up with some kind of policy. Uh, I don't know. If, I know, Mayor, you've kind of spoken up of, of the type of companies you want coming in here, but I think it's some that ties into water users because we've had a couple come in and there are some still out there that would, would be a nice company to have in your, in your city, but they're high water users. And I'm not sure they pay the income level to the employees that we want. 
So I think on our part. Interesting observation. Yeah. So I just wanted to throw that out, that it's a possibility we ought to get together and, and determine that. Um, Mayor, members of the council, council member Lord, uh, we couldn't agree more. We have been approached uh, recently with some very high water uh, users, some high-end water users, and we're trying to come up with a policy internal. We've developed a, a questionnaire. It's kind of a first step so that when a potential economic development candidate comes to the city, we can gauge quickly exactly some of the questions that you've raised. I think it's important, and I've had this dialogue with the city manager and, and the deputy city managers, that we value the resource itself, that when, when, a, when a user comes to the city, that resource that we would provide them has an intrinsic value. There's a, there's a finite amount of wastewater capacity at our treatment plants. There's a, fi there's a finite amount of capacity in the ground or surface water that the city has at its, at its uh, availability, so that we need, do need to, we do need to value that, we do need to take a look at that and weigh that. If economically it's a, it's a benefit to the city, then it's probably in the city's best interest, but we need to have some type of ability to gauge that if it's and weigh that cost. If it's a water user, it won't be in the end. Absolutely. If it's Somewhere two million road. gallons a day and it, and it won't bring in a lot, of, a lot of revenue for the city, is that a wise use if it's limited resource? Probably not. Mm -hmm. So we, we are working uh, internal with city manager and uh, we'd be happy to come back and present some of the ideas that we have. We're working with economic development now. Great. Propose that back to you. Then there was another question. I know we've we've had a briefing recently. Some of us um, from a company um, where they uh, I'll call it a widget. <laughs> that's a leak detection. A leak detection. Um, and so I I know now that when you have a leak, you're really just kind of listening to it. Is that is that correct? You, you don't have something on that is computerized. That, comes into the main water and says, okay, you've got a leak at such and such a street. And, and so you do have a bit more leakage by the time you get out to wherever the pipe has broken. And my, you know, I am not a water person. There's my water person. And I hope you, I'm not articulating this really well, except I do know <laughs> that there is something out there that would detect that leak sooner than what a person normally does when they're out there searching for the leak. Is that there, correct? Yes, that technology does okay. exist. We are purchasing technology right now for our staff where we can put out transducers on the gate valves or on, on hydrant branch valves, a widget transducer, yeah, the widget. Same. I like it's an East Coast though. term, yeah. um, <laughs> that will be able to listen and report back over a period of time um, and let us know if there's any leaks in the area. A lot of times, especially in this type of soil, leaks will not surface for quite a long time. The porosity of the soil is very conducive to a leak, um, and it takes a while for it to, to surface. So that there are technologies out there. Uh, some of the larger cities in the valley are actually installing these transducers on a permanent basis in their entire distribution system. It's very costly, and at this point, I'm not sure if there's the cost benefit is, is in the city's best interest, but as we expand over time, those type of technologies will be reduced in cost, and those are the type well, of things Well, I'm thinking we'll like in, in building our new city, it would not only be uh, a savings on water, but it's a savings on having to have something torn up Great. or streets blocked off. And so there's an ideal place to start with that kind of detection. Yeah, and, and actually, in our design guidelines, one of the proposals that we're tossing around internal is to incorporate leak detection as part of the warranty period so that before the city takes over that infrastructure after a year or two-year period, that there's a leak detection conducted by the developer or the contractor. And if there's a leak in that piece of infrastructure, it should be on their cost to go out and fix it, maintain it, repair it, and that's to save the city some money. So we, we're, we're, on, we're on board with your ideas. Appreciate that. No problem. And unlike uh, Councilman uh, Holland, um, I did grow up with knowing that you put the water in the glass, <laughs> brush your teeth, and you just use that only amount of water. Um, just because we didn't have a running water for years when I was growing up. And when we did get it, we cherished that water. Um, and that was back when we didn't have to worry about water resources like we are now. So um, I do think the, the public relation end of this is extremely important. And I just uh, I commend you for starting to take that role on. Uh, Mayor, Council Member Lord, thank you. Uh, th this is serious. This is serious stuff. Oh, and one other thing, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. The, when I looked through here, one of the things I thought was really easy to do for all of our new restaurants coming in, you had a high-pressure pre-rinse nozzles for restaurants. You recommended that. And that would seem like something really easy um, to do. I don't know if we could could give an incentive for them, each of them. To, you know, you can't, I guess, demand they're going to put that on. But we certainly could put some kind of incentive out. And they are high-water users. 
So um, that could be the $10 faucet. <laughs> Pardon me, is that $10? I think that's what we give them. Give them $10. We could give them away. So um, it would be nice if we could track that on all the new restaurants coming in to see if, in fact, they are using those high pressure nozzles. Yeah, um, Mayor, Council Member Lord, you're exactly right. This is this is what we're trying to uh, assess and evaluate in terms of. Uh, new design guidelines for, for commercial properties or residential properties, be it external use or interior use. I've got a hundred and I've got a hundred and thirty five dollar shower head that delivers less than half a gallon a minute and knocks you on your backside. So but well, we need to as, talk as opposed to kind of as, as, a, as opposed as opposed to a three or four dollar five dollar shower head. So it, it's all what you're willing to invest, but you need to make sure that it, first of all it's effective and that uh, you amortize your investment accordingly. I'm done. Thank you very much, Mayor. Councilmember Tony, just a uh, observ <clears throat> observation on the leak detection or uh, accounting for accounting for unaccounted losses, um, and some of the comments from Councilmember Holland about the um, water softeners and that sort of thing. I'm thinking back to a question I was asked last week with some grant programs that we're going after um, in, with the Indian uh, communities uh, here in Arizona. And it would seem to me, given the water packs that we have with the Gila River Indian community um, and some other opportunities here for some grant funding or going after different types of grants. You, you mentioned that, but we've got an older part of Goodyear that I'm sure we have, you know, we've done a lot of rehab in in terms of water, but I'm sure we have some opportunities where maybe we could do some demonstration projects and partner with somebody that could show some empirical data and, and go after some sort of grant funds uh, in that. At the same token, on the extreme other end, I was at a Valley Forward lunch and I sat there and Greg Bialy, is that how you say his last name? Oh, yes. From Newland Communities espoused that they want to be a green community. So hold him to his word and go out there and let's let's do demonstration projects on, on both ends of the spectrum. Um, or at least go after it. So it's just a, a well, thought. Well, even, even Westcorp, we yeah. should be thinking about Westcorps are coming in. We should be having this dialogue it's, with Westcorp. Yeah, well, although, yeah, I don't Not know that they're going to be a huge water user, but, but yeah. Mayor, but, Mayor anyway. Councilmember Antoniak, the Gila Tribe has uh, funded uh, over the last two years uh, two projects through the Arizona Municipal Water Users Association that Goodyear was involved in. Um, and, and it's nice to have that kind of relationship with, uh, uh, with, with the tribe. Uh, we, we've opened up a dialogue on our annexation down south, so we'll, we'll continue to pursue that with them uh, on an individual basis. But yeah, money, money's out there. I'm thinking something specific, and I, don't, I mean, just talking out loud here, something specifically that's like 50 homeowners or 100 homeowners, they know they're a part of that group, just like we did with recycling. We brought the recycling effort up to the forefront in some people's minds because we had 300 containers in two different communities. They knew what was going on. They knew how, you know, what was happening. They saw the differences between their trash collection and their neighbor's trash collection and, and that sort of thing. So um, two other, two other uh, observations. Um, you talked about stage one reducing our water consumption by 5%. I would challenge us to say why couldn't we do that today? Why do we have to wait until a certain time period? Is there, is there something that we could challenge you all as staff and to, to come to us or, or put out some internal you know, contest or whatever it is that, you know, how do, how do we save water in the city sort of um, conversation that could occur. And then lastly, and this may take a little bit to follow my train of thought here, between public and private water providers, there's a much different mentality. And I've sat in a boardroom of a private water company here in Arizona, and we were happy when there was a drought because the same amount of miles of pipe delivered twice the amount of water that month. And our profits, you know, community that only has a 6% return on investment were higher that month. And therefore, we looked better to our more sophisticated and more articulate East Coast partners. And so we, we, didn't have, we didn't have the motivation that intrinsically we do as public leaders. And so one aspect when I was reading this that whether I wouldn't say it was necessarily missing, but I didn't necessarily pick up on, is aggressively uh, pursuing state and federal policies, which you do through your professional associations, but I would encourage you to keep doing uh, to make that somewhat of a fair playing ground. Because while Lipsco and City of Goodyear are two different water companies, they're codependent upon one another. We're drawing from a lot of the same sources, uh, and we have a lot of the same, maybe not the same source sources, but overall the same larger source. But um, if there's a way to to bring that 
and, and, and that's, a, that's a challenge between the Corporation Commission, you know, fourth arm of government and the third arm of government uh, in our state. But if there's opportunities to pursue those avenues, I'd be all for it. Nice report. Okay, Dave, just to finish up quickly. Uh, I agree. Uh, this, first off, nice presentation. My pleasure, sir. And uh, this is an excellent plan, Sean. So good work, Stephen. Uh, this is one of the best plans I've seen, actually. Uh, just a couple of quickies. You know, we're, we're talking about uh, that you want to get with all your departments and, and uh, stakeholders. Uh, some of this isn't really brain surgery. We've, we've sort of done some of this before. Uh, if we can accelerate some of these things, I think I we should. I think that's where you're coming from. Let's do 5% well, now. I, I mean, I'd, yeah, I'd rather be in a position where we don't have to enter stage one. We've got, you know, Dick brought up the uh, hot water acceleration thing. I forget what they call that thing. Recirculating. Yeah, right. right. Uh, you know, we could, uh, we could also give those re rebates again to individuals. We could give them to, we can offer it to builders so that they offer it to home buyers. Uh, next year, we'll build 2,000 homes in this city. Well, why are we waiting? I agree. Uh, another thing is uh, the turf in the front. Uh, you need turf in the back for your, for your kids, I think. But in the front, maybe they don't. And if, in fact, it is a water consumer, although that's argued by some people, uh, then why don't we offer to builders or tell them to tell people that uh, we'll, if uh, for, per square foot of front yard, if you don't put a y grass in there, we'll rebate per, uh, real property taxes for five years or something for some some small amount. But uh, you know we need to put money on this subject if we really want to cut back on water. Right, rewards. You have to have a reward. Yeah, please. this is it's a reward this program. This is one of the most critical things we do in this state. So I think. Acceleration of our thought processes is in order here. Appreciate that input, Mayor. And can can yes. I follow along with what you just said? Mm -hmm. You know, um, a lot of people move in here from other areas, and they're used to having grass everywhere. And they come here, and everything looks so, especially if they come in the summer, it looks kind of different. Um, but we've been, in our community, we've experimented quite a bit with artificial turf. And, uh, and George and I both are, are very familiar with that. And seen many, many different manufacturers that have come in and demonstrated to us, and I was amazed. We were amazed. It, there's some really great product out there, and uh, we had them bring it in so we could, you know, smell it and feel it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Show us how they made it, the whole business. Yeah, it, it would be something, again, in your information, getting out to people. Um, and we do in, in uh, Pebble Creek. Gary, what is the percentage on Do you remember on uh, grass? 30. 30%. But no more than 30% no, of the right, landscape? Right. So I mean, we have it in, the, in that community. It was accepted beautifully. I don't know why we couldn't that's, do that. That's in the city, isn't it? Is it in the city, 30%? Yeah, I think so. It is. Oh, all right. Good. <laughs> but anyway, nice job. Thank you. Mayor, Thank Council, you. this concludes my five-minute presentation. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> I think we're next on our fire station. Hello, Mayor and Council. Um, I'm Neil Barton, Public Works Department. Uh, what we presented today, um, we have LEA Architects um, to present to you the, uh, the renderings and the elevations um, from Fire Station 185, we recently uh, approved the purchase of the land. What I wanted to give you a little bit of feedback, on April 4th we had a uh, public meeting uh, at the uh, Pebble Creek uh, Tuscany Ballroom. We had phenomenal turnout, um, one, biggest one I've been to. We had probably 200 uh, citizens show up. Uh, it was uh, overwhelming. Uh, they were so excited about the fire station and wanted to know when it was going to be done, of course. Um, but overall, uh, Randy and, uh, and Larry are here today to show you those renderings that we also presented to, to the citizens. Um, overall, the citizens actually were 50-50. We have two schemes, uh, Scheme 1 and Scheme 2. Uh, it was 50-50 for the people on the comment cards. And then on the comment cards that the public provided, uh, they had a 50% on color A and color B. Um, there was nobody that likes color C. So, uh, Larry's here. Um, I'll go ahead and bring forward the, uh, the poster boards, and, uh, and I'm going to turn it over to Larry. While you're doing that, 
Could you turn the thermostat up a bit? So it's warmer. It's cold. Mm -hmm. I need earmuffs. Oh, you're cold. It's cold. Yeah. It's freezing over here. It is cold. <laughs> Mayor Cavanaugh, <laughs> Vice Mayor Cavalier, members of the City Council. Good evening. I'm Larry Enyart, principal of LEA Architects. And with me tonight is Randy Jones, our senior project manager and longtime member of LEA Architects. And as Neil said, we had a meeting on April 4th. Uh, with the citizens and uh, the results I thought were quite good. A lot of enthusiasm for the fire station. We have a presentation tonight and I'll get started on it. In advancing the slides, who does that? Okay. Uh, what we're looking at here is our site plan on um, <coughs> Clubhouse Drive and, and uh, Pebble Creek. Up in the uh, left side of the slide, uh, about center, is the fire station site. It's 1.1 acres. Uh, fits uh, in there quite cozily. Uh, for example, fire station 184 was a 2.5 acre site. This is 1.1 acres. Fairly tight site, very compressed. Site plan essentially sets up uh, the site plan uh, or the building is facing north. The site is skewed uh, a little bit. We have the median on uh, Clubhouse Drive there that we are going to shorten slightly to facilitate uh, leaving uh, the fire station and also returning. The uh, site offers three public parking places and approximately 16 parking places for staff. Features a hose wash, emergency generator, uh, retention areas, and so on. Floor plan is uh, very straightforward, two-bay fire station with eight dormitories, kitchen, dining, day room, and police office near the lobby. We have infectious disease control, turnout gear, and other things that happen on the left side or west side of the site. What I'm showing you now is scheme one, and uh, scheme one and two are very similar in floor plans. The salient difference is the mezzanine storage. We have mezzanine storage that is very precious in a fire station uh, located above the watch room and actually uh, contiguous to the apparatus base. All mechanical uh, equipment is screened in this scheme. Uh, these are the elevations of scheme one. Uh, what this elevation uh, strategy is showing is perhaps the preferred scheme A. And we'll come back to that later. What we have here is a gently sloping roof. We have masonry, uh, split face block. We have an, uh, a stucco or EFA system in two colors, kind of a taupe beige. And then the uh, little darker color uh, towards the top part of the building, which is the dark terracotta. We have a champagne middle roof and generous uh, use of landscaping and indigenous landscape, uh, landscaping, xeriscape. A section through the building, you can see the general, gently sloping roof, the apparatus bays, the mezzanine storage, uh, screen mechanical equipment, our uh, training room. Elevation. Larry, Larry, excuse me. Yes, Which sir. way does the, go back one. Which way this is facing, which direction, and what's the low point? Is it towards the north, south, east, or west? Well, this is a section through the building, and we're essentially looking to the north. Cross section through the building, looking okay, towards the Okay, so the right side is basically towards Pebble Creek Parkway? That is correct. Okay. This is the northwest perspective view. We are, uh, we have uh, kind of a fireplace uh, looking features which are really exhaust uh, functions for the fire station. They are really uh, manifolding and ganging together the exhaust and vent through roofs uh, to have a very clean roof. We have uh, sort of like station 184 where you have the column pylons with a little bit of a low uh, level of lighting in them which adds a, a very nice quality to the building. Lots of uh, landscaping, xeriscaping. Another view, northwest, or excuse me, northeast perspective view. Our flag uh, poles, uh, uh, United States flag and state of Arizona flag. 
southwest perspective view from the rear. Moving right along to Scheme 2, uh, Scheme 2 is very similar in plan, uh, almost the same in site planning. The difference is really the mezzanine storage. Rather than being on the uh, center of the building, this one is towards the west. Uh, and uh, about the same in area for the mezzanine storage. But again, we have the eight dormitories, kitchen, dining, day room, uh, conference area, and police office, and men and women's toilets, watch room, turnout, infectious disease control, and so on. Can you, can you go back to that real quick? Sorry. It's that on this west end of the building, or southwest end of the building, is that an air handler unit at ground level? Or an EVAP unit at ground level? Or that, is is that, an EVAP, that is a screened evaporative cooling unit at grade, at, and, at and ground level. In scheme one, is that on the roof? That is correct. That's yes. Okay, so I did note it. Okay. Yes. <coughs> Uh, these are the elevations of uh, Scheme 2. Uh, different uh, roof line there. Uh, we have um, more use of metal roof, more use of uh, standing seam roof, a considerable amount of uh, uh, roofing. In fact, this scheme is slightly more expensive than Scheme 1. <laughs> Uh, color options, uh, we spoke about uh, color scheme A, which is the very top. Um, taupe or beige uh, colored ephus, uh, gray, uh, integral colored split face, and then the dark terracotta on the sloping uh, metal roof edge and mechanical screens. Scheme B is really a, a um, gray scheme, and scheme C is a lot more use of the terracotta color. We prefer Scheme A, but you may have your preference. That pretty much wraps up the Scheme A and or Scheme One and Scheme Two with color options A, B, and C. So, if you have any questions, I'd be glad to, to uh, answer them. So, you have three schemes? No, three colors and two schemes. Yes, that? sir. That's okay. correct. Okay. Uh, and you would like our input on that? Yes, sir, I would. Let me start on this side this time. Well, I think the people of Pebble Creek knew what they were talking about when they said scheme one. Yeah. Color. And the color, uh, either uh, A or C. Thank you. I, I, I prefer uh, scheme one to over scheme two. Only for the sole purpose that I noticed there were only six reclining chairs in front of the television. And, uh, and that the air handler was uh, on the roof. No. Um, yeah, I, I like scheme one. But the, the archi I think the architecture of it is much nicer and it goes with the area, and I prefer color option A. Thank you. That's member Osborne. Scheme one and A. Uh, the same, exactly the same. I, I just had one. Just uh, to make sure that I'm understanding it, when the uh, fire alarm goes off, the station fire trucks will exit onto Clubhouse Drive. Okay. So, but they will be serving other areas besides just the Pebble Creek area. Because they could be called in to serve other areas, uh, yeah. correct? Uh, Chief? Uh, Chief, so Chief uh, Mark Gellard <laughs> and Chief Mike Ullman are in the audience. Oh, uh, <laughs> Mr. Mayor, uh, Council Member Holland, yes, it's a Goodyear fire station. It'll, you know, it'll serve as a part of a system of fire stations that are distributed across the community. Um, but likely the predominance of their work will be in, in Pebble Creek. We think it's such. I just wondered, because since we were exiting on to Clubhouse Drive, if that would be a. Any well, we we actually prefer, uh, and and if you'll if you'll recall, perhaps some of the other fire station designs, we like to control the light, and we like to come out onto a a, 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 a collector uh -huh. that isn't as busy, so we can control the light and get our large, slow-moving apparatus kind of through those intersections, because that's where we're likely to have problems. 
Uh, and so, so our, our solution for that has been to try to end up in the configuration that you've seen at Station uh, 183 and what's being proposed here as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Yeah, the only thing, it's it's a beautiful design, either one of them, know, scheme A or, or one or two, either one. The thing that I like the most about this is that we have all these different fire stations and they all have a unique design and they all stand out in their community. And I think that's great. I think so. Whatever you determine, whatever the community determines, um, they like the best. But the scheme one and, and A, to me, is also loud. I like the best, but it mostly fits in with the design of what we have here, and I guess that's why. But uh, again, it's a nice design, nice elevation, and it will fit very nicely in the community. Thank you, Vice Mayor Cavalier. Okay, I, I like 1A too. I'd like them all. I think 1A preferred. Any other further comments? Just less. Okay. The drive in and out question. Are you then, if you're going? Back into the station, or are you coming in the same driveway you went out and just making a loop around the building? If, if you're if you're coming westbound on Clubhouse Drive from Pebble Creek Park, I'm just I'm curious from a neighbor if I'm a neighbor that's living there perspective. Yeah. You got Clubhouse Drive, egress and ingress are both. It's the same driveway. Okay. We'll actually swim around. Okay. The, the security mm -hmm. Okay. The, the other opportunity is going. Uh, if you're coming out, right. And coming back this way. Uh, this is a gatehouse. This is stacked traffic, right. and we need to have some options. That's what I was saying. Thank you very much. We really want to thank the uh, members of the user group, fire department, uh, Chief uh, Mark Galliard, Mike Ullman, and all those that helped, and especially the 200 uh, guests that were at the neighborhood meeting that were very supportive of, the, of this project. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll now move to the city facilities master plan. Sorry, you, you guys can see me all day long. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> well, you picked the right color shirt. So well, thank you. Yeah. Well, uh, next, uh, we'd like to, we have our consultants from Doyce Associates, uh, Jamie Curry and, uh, and her team, to uh, present uh, a final draft for our city facility master plan. And uh, at that time, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jamie. And uh, if you have any questions, we'll ask you can. Do I need to hold off for a second, or I'm oh, sure just move to the? Oh, they both went. Oh. <laughs> Lost a couple. <laughs> young kids. <laughs> Give them another minute here, okay? Right. State your name for the record. Jamie Curry with Deutsch Associates. Do you have other people here that you want to introduce? I do. <laughs> with me is Tammy Carr and David Calcaterra, also from Deutsch Associates. Okay, you're welcome. You're doing great so far. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone wants to see that. I guess I can Did you do your plan before the uh, 
the county and Buckeye agreed to a firing range out in the county land out there in Buckeye. It was, wasn't it? I think this plan precedes that. Yes. Here we go. Okay. Thank you. Mayor, members of the council, we are here tonight, as Neil said, to present our, our final uh, final version, our final draft of the facilities master plan. Um, as everyone's aware, we have been working um, with city staff on this project for about a year now. Um, and I have uh, been here previously to to present to you. And um, in order to not you know, have too much repetition here, we're going to very, very briefly um, you know, kind of cover what our scope on this project was. And then we're going to go ahead and jump right into our recommendations. Um, so if when I'm finished, if there are any questions on where some of this information came from, we can certainly um, backtrack a little bit. I know everyone has the, the, um, the full document that kind of covers it. But I'm going to try and, try and breeze through the information that we've, that we've gone over um, previously. So the scope of this master plan, what we set out to accomplish, um, you know, one of the main things was that uh, the city had several ongoing master plans for specific facilities, and we wanted to make sure that there was one document that kind of um, prioritized those projects in comparison to one another, made sure that CIP funding um, was kind of appropriately scheduled out for all those projects. Um, potential projects being evaluated through um, both your priorities and also um, through citizens' priorities. And we did hold um, a public meeting several months ago to kind of gauge that. Um, we also used the 2004 and 2005 citizen surveys um, that you had completed um, and kind of merged those two, um, those two findings um, in order to gather some of those opinions on what your citizens really want. Um, Using appropriate and available city-owned lands, we wanted to make sure that each site um, had its most appropriate use on it. Um, facilities which need to be grouped together, obviously we want to make sure they all fit on your available parcels of land. So we looked at those pieces of land in comparison to each other, make sure we were using things efficiently. Um, obviously you have some current facilities that are um, being outgrown for their current purpose, but we wanted to make sure that um, those valuable resources were um, used in an appropriate way in the future. So definitely we're looking at your current facilities. Um, phasing, financing, and other strategy options I'll get into a little more. Um, that's definitely something we wanted to cover. And then lastly, um, providing independent recommendations. Um, as you all are, are intimately aware, um, a very dynamic time in the city's growth right now. There are a lot of projects that are ongoing. And so um, I think one of the most challenging things that we've tried to do in this master plan is to encompass all of those projects. And since we've been working on this project for a year, lots of things have changed. So you originally asked us to provide our independent recommendations um, for best possible scenarios for lots of different projects. So as, you go th as we go through this, you'll see that some of our recommendations have already been implemented um, by staff and by yourselves. And some of them have been implemented um, not exactly as we were recommending, but certainly moving forward with those. So um, I just want to kind of preface that by saying these are our, our recommendations. So we, we really grouped this, um, this document that you, that you already have in front of you into major decision factors, um, things like what our citizen priorities are, um, what are the most pressing staff needs, um, overall strategies, um, and then again, we'll go into our recommendations. So the decision factors, as I mentioned, some things we really want to consider. Um, for example, the first one on there, um, locations of major citizen service areas. Um, given that the town is still um, being built out with so much residential, each time that there's a major <laughs> development, that really affects where your citizens are and how easily departments that serve citizens at their homes or at their places of business can get to those citizens. Um, so any of our departments that are mobile, you know, we need to consider that um, as the city expands, they may need satellite op operation centers. They may need, you know, two main operation centers. Um, so really um, addressing those issues. And I, and I won't run through all of these. Um, a couple others to just call out number five, um, state and federal statute concerns. Certainly anywhere where we feel we have safety issues currently, um, addressing those as in new facilities as a priority. Um, 
meeting existing citizen expectations. Again, that was coming from your citizen surveys. And then obviously attracting new citizens to Goodyear. We want to make sure that we are, are pro providing things that are equitable um, to the other cities. Overall strategies, um, and we kind of we kind of went through these the last time we presented, but we really want to want to stress these um, alternative project delivery methods, including construction manager at risk and design build, um, use of funds, um, which kind of encompasses several several important factors, um, not leasing facilities anymore as soon as possible, um, building high impact projects. Um, you know, one of the things that was mentioned in the um, in the previous. Um, presentation up here, um, Vice Mayor Cavalier was asking about um, lead construction, and that was something that we, you know, thought about in here is, you know, something that you want to serve as an example to your citizens, which projects, you know, could potentially be appropriate for that type of construction, um, you know, that get a lot of citizen, um, citizen use and that, you know, they could really appreciate that. Um, Public-private partnerships um, is certainly something that in the last couple months there's been lots of action on. Um, so we're really excited to see that that's proceeding, giving you a really good option for, for moving projects along in their timelines. Um, and then intergovernmental agreements and um, some more creative negotiations um, with developers both on the residential and commercial side. So jumping right into our recommendations. Um, as I said, if, you, if at the end you have questions about how we got here, I'd certainly be happy to, to run back through that. City Center um, is what we've just defined as the 40 acres that are that's right at the corner. Um, and our three main recommendations for that were the City Hall, the Central Library, and the Performing Arts Center. Really um, looking at the um, City Center specific area plan um, that was also completed for this area and appropriate uses you know, for those um, compatible land uses. Um, and again, this might be um, one example of a project where our, our timetables were kind of, um, may now be uh, accelerated based on that master plan from what we understand. The 100 acres north of that right now, um, I know is um, under the same master plan. Recommendations were a city recreation complex, which again, I think will really fit in appropriately with that specific area plan, and then university campuses. Obviously, lots of opportunities on this one um, for some partnerships with the university and for everything from some of the recreation areas to parking, just all kinds of, all kinds of good opportunities there. Um, the Patterson property, uh, our recommendations included obviously maintaining the wastewater treatment plant, um, the BMX park, and the dog park exactly um, as they are. And then our two new facilities on here, uh, we are recommending the Public Safety Administration Building and the Public Works Corporate Yard. Um, again, the Public Works Corporate Yard being out for um, you know an RFP for a developer, you know, really the the salient point here is that this is a good area for that, um, good access to transportation. Um, if there's available land in that same general area, obviously that's, that's still definitely applicable. Um, and then we are suggesting that um, based on those site plans, there is a possibility for sale or trade of some of the Estrella Parkway frontage. So um, selling that off to a commercial developer that um, could then be traded for some other appropriate land for a different city facility, uh, definitely something we would recommend considering. The IOB, um, based on our other recommendations of um, City Hall being one of the top priority projects, um, this facility could be available um, based on what is planned or um, what was master planned for the needs for the court, um, the justice facility. Uh, that seems to be an appropriate use for that. Um, another thing that we're suggesting in here is potential location for temporary or hoteling offices. As a lot of projects um, get underway potentially at the same time, um, and if the court were to move to IOB immediately, there'd still be obviously some extra space. So the second floor might be an appropriate place to kind of shuffle people as new spaces are being built and kind of maintain some, some temporary offices as, as things are happening. Um, the Duncan Farms property, um, again, this seems to be a good, a good parcel um, for sale or trade um, to an industrial developer since it's, it's very limited in its use um, based on the Luke Air Force fly zone. Um, and again, really trying to get some, some other property that could be more appropriate for city needs either immediately or for land banking. Which really brings us to our, our last and um, possibly most important point is land banking um, in areas of future growth, areas that we know the land prices are going to increase. 
um, to really try and make some intelligent um, um, best case guesses and purchase land, um, public work satellite facilities, um, obviously recreation facilities, public safety facilities in these areas. Um, and then, of course, um, with the Sonoran Valley annexation um, being new, new news, that we want to make sure that land banking in that area um, occurs you know, thoughtfully now also. And with that, I would, I would ask for any questions or uh, requests for the, the final document. So before we go around, uh, Jim, are we, are we to talk time frames here, or is that for a different time and a different plan and a different consultant? Uh, Mayor, council members, when you say time, are you, you mean like the, the Arts frame? Center 2017? Is going to be? Are we to be concerned about that today, or is that going to be a different subject? Fair question. Uh, I would, I would submit that it's. It's certainly worthy of, of discussion. As Jamie noted, her recommendations are based solely on the information that they gathered from both you and the citizen input uh, through their um, feedback sessions. We have accelerated certain projects, Performing Arts being one, based on looking for other joint opportunities, public-private partnerships. And assuming those do materialize, then we're going to carry out the time, the current time frame we're on versus what's noted in her report. If for some reason those don't work out, then we would fall back to this information unless you provide uh, different feedback for their consideration this evening for them to weave into the report. But we're not going to, let me bottom line my answer for you, we're not going to allow these dates to affect the efforts we're making right now, only if those don't lead to um, uh, projects being developed through those partnerships would we default to the dates that uh, Jamie's report provides. Does, does that answer your question? It, it does. It does. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so you're ready for questions? I am. Okay. Mr. Gelzer from the public. Um, Gary Gelzer, could you uh, elaborate on the height and square footage of the proposed city hall and council chambers, uh, basically um, in relation to the interim office building that we have now? Um, Mayor and Council, sir, uh, that to that level of detail and schematic was actually not uh, part of the scope of this. It was more to facilitate land that we currently have and uh, location of facilities to, to that level of mass. That should be addressed in the master plan that I believe is actually already underway. Um, so that, that part of the scope is not done in this, in this master plan. It's, it's, it's a very valid question because it does affect what we're going to put there. How high are we going to go? I mean, what can we get in there? Uh, but, okay, let's start over this on the right this time. Council Member Oswald. Hi. Uh, a couple of questions on a few of these charts. I was not sure, um, for example, uh, City Hall Department's tab two, page one. You have the square footage. You know, you have every little section, and then you go into the square footage. Is that what's current, or is that what's needed? Uh, Mayor, Councilmember Osborne, those are actually, uh, those are current figures. Current, and then as you see them going into the future years. Because you have 2005 to 2010, so where, where it says 2007, for example, City Clerk's Department Space, is uh, 2,830, so that's current. Uh, Can you confirm what tab I'm you're sorry, referring what page to? You on? You said tab, two, tab two, page one. I apologize. Big book. <laughs> oh. Oh, oh, okay. I'm sorry. Mayor, Councilmember Osborne. 
Um, what you're what you're seeing in the in the large book is actually um, kind of a conglomeration of our backup material. That very first document is actually a document we completed for the city um, in 2005, and it was a bridging plan um, looking at how to get departments from 2005 to 2010 only. So those were existing back in 05. What you're seeing for 07 was projection. Okay. So then then some of these other charts. Um, don't necessarily have the Venita property put into this. Correct. And actually, the the um, lease of the Venita property is something that that kind of came out of the needs that were identified within that bridging study. Okay, great. All right. Um, one of the recommendations that you had for um, funding mm -hmm. was regarding a. Um, Public safety sales tax. Has that been discussed in any form? Uh, Mayor, Mayor, members of the council, that actually was generated from a public safety um, advisory committee report um, that we received, and that was one of their highest recommendations. Um, if anyone else here has more information about that, I would invite them to, to speak to it, but that was where that recommendation came from. Thank you. Um, I'd like to speak to that. The council, the public safety committee said that if the council so chose to go that route, they would support them. They did not recommend <coughs> it as a way to go. Okay. Well, I guess the other recommendation was. Oh, no, go on. Go ahead. Next. No questions. Member Lord. No, I just thought it was interesting, and because uh, I, I just hadn't been thinking about land banking. Uh, brought up, and and I've often talked. I know we've talked about that piece of land that sits right behind the hundred acre park. It's still sitting behind there, which is mm -hmm. such an, an ideal. That little May piece, mm -hmm. sixty acres. <laughs> yeah. It just, you know, I know. Can we? Where can we find that pot of gold? But that is a, just an ideal piece to connect the universities. Oh, I agree. Two-way transportation going into the university, so you know, being in that. <coughs> yeah. So, anyway, but that, but that's the part that I thought. And the idea that maybe we are start thinking about trading some of that land, like Duncan Farms, and mm -hmm. trying to find places to build some of these other facilities. Antonio. Where was the land banking map that you showed us? Um, I, I was, I obviously found this before, but I was having a hard time finding it again tonight. I'm flipping through this, trying to find it. Me too. Sorry, I've got y'all coming. You can tell me afterwards. I just wanted to look at it, but that you might. If not, maybe email a copy to us or something. Uh, okay. Uh, Mayor and Councilmember Antonio, we will certainly make sure that's in our final version. I apologize. It's on your screens now. Thank you. Yeah, I, I did. I'm definitely a proponent of this. I mean, there's no doubt we should, you know, as, as development advances, we ought to look at opportunities to, you know, at least grab some as we move south, uh, if it's fiscally feasible for us to do so. Um, the only other comment is if we can move into a city center by 2009. Oh, I'd love it. <laughs> it would, that'd be awesome. So that would be, I, and I think it's a doable thing if we get really serious about it, which we are. You know what struck me when I read this? Uh, one of your sentences is a, a potential threat to the city's ability um, uh, to our population and to our staff. You've gotten to that point. What meaning that, that lack, well, of lack of space? Lack of space. Well, yeah. And um, yeah, I just there was a presentation last night on television about from another police department. And they were talking about how they're going out of state and getting other people to come here to work and. 
and I'm thinking, you know, we can't sell them on the fact that we have a great facility for them yet. <laughs> we can't close on that one. It would be nice to be able to, be able, be able to say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, uh, very nicely done plan. Uh, yeah. You were finished there? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I really would, uh, I would hope that we'd get that uh, Performing Arts Center done much earlier than 2017. And I don't know if they brought into your planning the uh, the opportunity for very much of a public-private partnership to get that done, and I would hope we could proceed there. The library needs to be as soon as possible. But if we could do 2009 in City Hall, that we, we really want that. Uh, and maybe it's uh, pub privately funded, publicly uh, utilized, and and leased or whatever. But there are so many different financial opportunities here that we need buildings built. And I agree with Mr. Gelser. He didn't say it outright, but <laughs> we want to go up. Well, I, I think the last discussion we had here really was, I wish Harvey was here Tell me how many floors we stopped at. Oh, Harvey? What was, how many floors are we at right now? I mean, we're higher than Gary had anticipated in the city hall at the last... Is it eight? Eight floors, no. at least? Seven. Pardon? Yeah, tell us how many stories that is, because that won't mean anything. Twelve. Oh, seven or eight. Uh, yeah, it's usually it's only seven or eight. Probably seven or eight. About, I guess, bigger floors. All right, let's go eight. Old school. Let's take the top number. <laughs> and, and, and what is that that you're referring to? City Hall. But what? 150 is what? I, I, where's uh, that stated? Strategic plan. In our city center specific area plan, when we adopted the specific area plan, we provided for um, height limitations on the, in, the, in the plan and, and 150 feet in the center. And then as we gravitate outward, then it would go down in height. So there's some flexibility on that, I assume. Oh. We set maximum limits, in fact, well, in some, in some streets, on Australia Parkway and the Main Street, we actually set up, we wanted a max, uh, uh, a minimum of two stories. So we set some areas where there's a minimum of two stories, but we just set an upper limit because of the airport overflight area. Oh. We had to, FAA would not allow us to go beyond uh, 150 feet. Oh, okay. Could we have the police, the public safety admin facility incorporated within the city hall? Or a part of it. Okay, Kavanaugh, members of the council. Um, I, I think it probably could be. I think that some of the uses for uh, what we would need that building for may not be compatible with the public coming and going from that building. Um, you know, and then looking at logistically, where what floor would the police be on, and, and to do operational uh, jobs might. Uh, not be conducive to the public coming into a building like that. So I, those things could be designed in, I'm certain, but uh, as far as um, It was discussed how that would work, during the yeah. city center. So that was it was discussed at was great ends, and that the conclusion was that, possible, uh, that, that they'd be better in a different building. Right. I, I believe parking issues and, and, and storage of, of large vehicles, too, may be problematic for a site like that as well. And I think going vertically certainly is a is the way to go, but looking at the footprint itself and having sufficient parking, absent parking garages or those kinds of things may be problematic for us. Yeah, the thing is we don't want city center to be a large parking lot. You know, that's True. I mean to utilize that very precious acreage for parking. Correct. Is, a, is an issue we need to contend with. Correct. But anyway. Comments, other comments, or? I don't want to know that. It's like, we can't do too much with the uh, public um, works <coughs> facility yet because we we don't know where the 801 or the reliever is going through. Is that not true? I mean, that can't, we know it's going to be down in that area somewhere. Months away from it. Uh, yeah, okay, well, you can tell us. <laughs> Uh, Mayor, Council Members, we have uh, narrowed the alignment down to uh, two alignments, two options. And when it uh, travels through Goodyear, the alignment, there's only one 
ultimate alignment through Goodyear, and that's just, just north of our wastewater treatment plant. Um, the pinch points are the wastewater treatment plant and the uh, Phoenix Goodyear Airport. So the only alignment that we're looking at is just, just north of the wastewater treatment plant. So you could, in essence, find a spot in there that city property that would easily facilitate building a public works complex in that area somewhere. Well, what um, we've requested from uh, ADOT and, uh, and the stakeholders is to try to align that new uh, freeway corridor as close as they can to the wastewater northern boundaries of the wastewater treatment plant, not to uh, compromise any of the operations, but then maximize our property to the north. And that would allow or hopefully facilitate us locating a future city facility if, if it's the Public Works Corporate Yard. Thank you. Uh, Cato, we'll let Neil put that on Elmo so that everybody can see the property so you can point out where the freeway alignment is. Do the zoom feature. Keep going. There you go. Point out the wastewater plant, the dog park, et cetera. Uh, the wastewater treatment plant is here, and the um, we've um, asked that this northern boundary that uh, between the green part and the brown part move about 200 feet to the north. So we've asked ADOT to align that free to a corridor in and around that northern boundary. So in and around here. How much land does it leave on the north side if they push up against the wastewater treatment plant to the south? Um, the, those details we're working out. They've asked for. Um, they're using a, a thousand foot uh, corridor as 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 the alignment option. Once the alignment's designated to one ultimate alignment, hopefully we can narrow that corridor down to at least uh, 300 feet wide. We think the corridor through our uh, our area from Estrella Parkway um, west will take up about 40 acres. Um, we are st still analyzing what that leaves us north of the wastewater treatment plant, but we think it'd be enough for us to locate a facility. How large facility do you need? How many square foot? Uh, for Public Works Corporate Yard, it's uh, in and around 45 acres. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Cable. Thank you. Neil, would you go to the tab? I think it's tab two, page two. It's the one that has a spreadsheet with all the X's on all the facilities by property, and one page back behind it. No, the other way. That one. Can you put that up there? And what does this illustrate, uh, Jamie? Yeah, absolutely. Um, what we're trying to get across here is that all of these recommendations are dictated by our major decision factors. So, you know, this major decision factor portion that we have in here is, is really the, the most critical issues facing the, the facilities needs in the city. And so we basically looked at each of these projects in comparison to those decision factors. What does this project solve? What does it help you accomplish? Um, and so that's what you're seeing here. So for example, um, City Hall, um, obviously locating a, a bit further south, um, assists with locations of major citi citizen service areas. Benefits of facility ownership, the new City Hall, certainly you wouldn't be leasing that. Um, it was a, a priority that you um, as mayor and council gave us. So we kind of, you know, <coughs> graded each project based on those. And the information you have here in large part is contained in all these various documents here. You've taken and summarized it to this page. Exactly. So that so that big book, you know, incorporates citizen the citizen survey as we mentioned that we've incorporated. Um, I believe the, the public <coughs> safety advisory committee um, recommendations are, are all within there. Yeah, just, just a thought as, I, as I'm looking at this, that when it comes to Duncan Farms selling or trading, given the, given the 
sorry to put it this way, but given the nail pulling exercise we just went through and talking about purchasing property, I would, I'm almost a little hesitant on the seller trade aspect of that at this juncture. I'd like to see Palm Valley 303, is it Palm Valley 303? Is that the name of that yes. project? I'd almost like to see some of those projects that are up there within the influence zone mm -hmm. of Luke Air Force Base come to fruition before we start talking about selling or trading land that's within the influence zone or the APZs of, of Luke. I, I just want to make sure we don't, you know, just come to a rash decision that, I mean, we went through, that was an arduous process with 200 people in this building that night. I was in the audience, it was a couple of weeks before I sat up here, but it was a very, very arduous process for the council. And uh, I wouldn't want to create a problem for ourselves by being, you know, by uh, trying to expedite cash in our pockets in order to do something else with it. Uh, Mayor and Councilmember Antonica, if I might just mention also within that um, appendix document, um, they, in the very, very last um, document, as the Arizona Military Regional Compatibility Plan, which established the Luke Air Force zones. So you want any more information, that's also back there. You can see what um, uses are compatible with your land. Can, can you put that back up just for a sec? The first one? <laughs> what is the question mark for annexations in the Patterson property sale or trade expressway? The property is 100% in the city of Goodyear. It is. Is that supposed to be an X? It is. I apologize. That may be a typo. But but why would you have an X there if all these lands are already in the uh, annex? So that's something to look at. We'll take care of that. There was also, if I'm in there, I read somewhere there was a discussion about uh, police firing range. Mm -hmm. it was. was that part of your report, and, and was that part of the suggestion for Duncan Farms? Initially, uh, we did include um, the firing range as our recommendation for Duncan Farms. Um, the main reason that we've changed that during this process is that our understanding of what needs to happen at the firing range is that it also needs to be a training facility, um, which in its definition would gather people. So whereas the firing range in and of itself might have been appropriate, having training there is not appropriate for that use, and so that's why we modified that. And it's not appropriate because of what? Uh, the um, overlay zone um, that the Duncan Farms property is in dictates, it's a, it's a number of people per square foot on an average use that it dictates, and any gathering of people is way over that Or a Air Force Base. Exactly. Thank you. So I guess a warehouse is one of those things. It can, it can have a warehouse, but it can't have but, the yeah. concentration we're talking about. Correct. And I don't think we need to be thinking about a firing range anymore, do we? We're going to have one a few miles west of us? I mean, that's a lot of money. To, I'm, I was an advocate of a firing range until I heard the county is going to build one. Mark, can you come to the mic? Mayor Kavanaugh, that's going to be out at the uh, uh, Buckeye Hills area, and uh, that is still about uh, 33 miles from here. So as far as it, from a convenience standpoint, there are some other opportunities now that we have with uh, the annexation and some BLM land that we're currently looking at with Game and Fish. Some opportunities there that to where they could partner with us, and we could get some very affordable land through them. Okay. Thank you. Thank, okay, thank you. you. Okay. Um, any council member report on current events? Well, I, I guess I this is my opportunity to say uh, thank you for the. Council people, city managers, attendance to the Southwest Lending Closet Party held on last Thursday evening. Uh, it was a thank you to you, really, to say we appreciate your support. Uh, so this uh, important function can continue. And then we even had our new chief of staff there, so I really appreciate that. Okay, manager summary of current events and reports. And I think there was a request for a report. You asked for uh, an action item. 
Oh, uh, it's the policy. Yeah. Yes, okay. I just had to remember what it was here. The policy regarding uh, water? Uh, yeah, on, um, on what economic type development. Of, yes, on what type of users are coming to the yeah. city. Um, we wanted to analyze to know what kind of uh, income level those workers would have, what the benefit to the city is for the use of that water. So it all ties in. As part of uh, Shane's presentation or response back to you, yes, we've got that one as a follow-up. There was also a reference to looking at uh, grant funding for possible demonstration projects in such places as Historic Goodyear, Australia Mountain Ranch, uh, West Corps. And I think there was another one which was, we're getting feedback here from something, 5% uh, water conservation, do it now, don't wait for city-owned properties and facilities. Along with that, if we're going to do that, let's make sure we're publicizing that. Okay, make sure we're getting that right out from the public right away before we even ask the public to do anything. We're showing that we're doing it. I was going to say, I don't think it's necessarily asking the public to do it. It's no, I'm we're saying doing it to I want to show how it can be done. I'm not asking the public, but I want uh, the public to know we're doing it. To make them feel maybe a little guilty, you know, like your mother told you. So they'll start doing some things. I think it's kind of setting an example. Yeah. Trying to accelerate yeah. some of the activities to conserve water. Yes. It's setting an example for you. Yeah. Set examples. Like my mother told me. Okay. Meeting the church. Finger and all.